Hello and welcome back. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports and WeBuyGuns.com in Westfield, Indiana, and you are watching Marksman TV. Welcome back to another weekly used gun review. Remember, in these videos, we take about eight used firearms that have come into the store and give you guys a small review of each one at about two to four minutes apiece to give you guys an idea of some different stuff out there on the market. Remember, the point of this video is strictly to be entertaining and educational. We are not making this video to sell anything to keep in accordance with YouTube's policies. With all of that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump into it now. All right, this video is brought to you by our new website, WeBuyGuns.com. If you are considering selling a used firearm or firearm collection, please log into our site and create an account. You can then submit your firearms for an offer request. We do tend to get back to those offer requests within about 24 hours, and with that, you will be provided with an offer certificate, which you can take with you to competing gun stores to try and leverage yourself a better deal. If you're unable to get a better deal, go ahead and sell it to us. We do provide you with a shipping label, and we do pay you through either a paper check or ACH direct deposit to make the process as seamless and easy for you as possible. So remember, go check us out on webuyguns.com. Jumping into this video, we start with the most common and move through the least common as the video progresses. Starting us off on our number one spot is a personal favorite of mine. This is a Smith & Wesson model 686. Specifically, this is a 686 Plus Deluxe, one of the sort of the premium or most premium versions of the revolver that you can get. Now the 686 is a medium frame, kind of the K to L frame, uh, stainless steel version of the 586, which is a 357 Magnum revolver. Now development on this would begin with Smith & Wesson in 1980, and it would go into production in 1981, and is still in production today. As mentioned, it is a 357 revolver, always known for having this satin nickel, or satin stainless, I'm sorry, finish. They did have a midnight blue variation of it, but typically if you wanted the blue variation, you're again, you're looking at the 586. Now, in 1996, they would come out with a seven round cylinder capacity called the Plus model, which you see here. Both the standard model and the Plus model would be offered in two and a quarter, three, four, five. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the Plus was not offered in five, but the six inch and the base model offered additionally in a five and eight and three eighth inch barrel. They also have the performance center variations. They have the ported variations, uh, lots of different configurations of this but the plus model tends to be what most people gravitate towards because you are not increasing your size, but you are getting that seventh round in the cylinder. Um, beyond that, this is a deluxe model, most notably uh, noted by the deluxe wood grips on here. And this one here particularly has the six inch barrel really known as being a workhorse in the Smith & Wesson lineup and probably arguably one of their most popular, probably most owned revolvers in the larger frame variations. Now, of course, more iconic models like the Model 29 exist, are uh, the M&P line revolvers and stuff like that, the more classic ones in 1917. But as far as one in the large frame revolver that the most people own and use, it's probably going to be the 686. Now in the baseline, traditionally the pricing on these new is around the $750 range and they go up from there up to about $1,000 to $1,200 based on you know performance center deluxe models, things like that. The pricing of course is a little bit elevated right now. So you're between about $800 and $1,000 depending on the variation you're getting used as long as it's in good condition and the original box. So the 686, again, always I probably would say that this is my favorite 357 Magnum revolver from a practical utilitarian, uh, utilitarian and sort of standpoint, of course, notwithstanding things like the Colt Python for collectability. But if you want something that's really rugged, really gonna hold up well, uh, and under normal circumstances is absolutely really well priced for what it is, the 686 is probably one of the best products for Smith & Wesson, especially in the 357 line that I think you can get. Uh, and that's again, just my personal opinion. So always been a fan of this. This is my favorite 357 revolver. Really glad to have one to share with you guys. Okay, up next, I have a very popular line of small concealed carry pistols from Beretta. And these are the so-called tilting barrel pistols as the Model 21A uh, offered in 22 and 25, so I have one of each, and the Model 3032 offered in 32 automatic. These known as the Bobcat, this known as the Tomcat. So there you go. Tilting barrel Berettas. Okay, these would actually come onto the market in about 1984. They did have a, a slow production stop on these recently, but just started up production again uh, from Beretta. So you can actually still get these new today. Um, the tilting barrel concept, which what's you know, very popular and iconic about these. Uh, most people, when it comes to semi-automatic pistols, are familiar with the concept of loading the magazine, chambering your first round like this, and then firing until your magazine is empty, 
replacing the magazine and then getting back to shooting. Now this is a small frame aluminum alloy with a steel barrel, uh, steel slide, and does fire in single double action and does have a manual safety over here on the left side. Now what makes it a little bit untraditional is as I alluded to that tilting barrel mechanism. There's a lever here on the left hand side. You push on that and the barrel literally tilts up. Now the point for that is for people who might have hand strength issues, dexterity issues, or maybe really large hands and a difficulty bringing back the small slide on the pistol, is the concept here is to load the magazine, tilt the barrel up, pop one round into the chamber, close it, and then without having to rack the slide, you have a chambered round and you can uh, go to fire until you know the gun cycle is until empty, just like anything else. Now, owning a gun store, I will tell you, there are a lot of people who come in who have to settle on things like a revolver because they do not have the hand strength uh, needed to rack the slide on a handgun. Uh, concepts like this were really meant to come out and combat that sort of issue that some people are having. Where they can get into a semi-automatic concealed carry even though they might not have the hand strength to actuate the slides. Just a lot easier to use. One other interesting feature about this is it does not actually have an extractor. So it does depend solely on the expanding gas, the pressures to uh, to extract and blow the, essentially blow the casing uh, out of the chamber upon recoil. So really interesting. Because of that, the 22 variety can be a little bit picky on ammunition, the 25 and the 32 not so much. Um, this is the Inox version with the sort of the satin stainless slide. Uh, you can still get them today, so they are really, really cool handguns. Pricing wise, new, uh, they're not super expensive. I new and used, you tend to find them floating around the three to four hundred dollar price point, respectively, condition, original box, stuff like that. So, uh, really, really interesting handguns. Happy to get these in. Uh, these two came to us from two separate local sellers. This one came to us from a viewer in Texas. So, thank you so much for sending these along to us. Uh, really happy to get these in here for the video. So, the Beretta Tilting Barrel 21A and 30. 3032. Okay, up next is a very popular pistol from Beretta. This is the Beretta M9 A3. A lot of you probably would recognize this, and it does come to us from a viewer in North Carolina. So thank you so much for sending this one along to us. This is a double stack, 15 round capacity, 9 millimeter, with a decocker, decocker safety, which fires in double or single action. It has a accessory rail here at the bottom, threaded barrel, about 11 degree grip angle, and this, you know, flat dark earth coyote tan finish. They also make it in a black finish as well. And this would be the most modern or up-to-date iteration of the 92 series of pistols from Beretta. Now the history with this would begin back in 1975 when they would begin development, they being Beretta, on the, nine, on the 92 series of pistols. Now, development would begin in, in 75, and production would begin in 1976 with the first variation of the pistol. Now, around the time throughout the 1970s into the 1980s, the United States is considering moving into a, uh, a more full capacity 9mm configuration. A lot of other NATO countries had already taken the plunge in this regard. And NATO had been doing testing and determined that the side in a battle engagement or a skirmish that was able to produce a higher volume of fire was statistically more, more likely to win in an engagement. So this was sort of the impetus for moving from the seven round capacity 1911 and 45 ACP into a nine millimeter service sidearm. Now trials for the M9 series uh, or the M9 trials, so-called M9 trials would begin. Beretta would introduce the M9 series, or I should say at the time it was the 92 series or the 92 FS, which would be adopted by the United States military in 1985, adopted as a designation M9. Now it would stay in, in our military all the way up until about 2015 when the United States uh, military again would try to put out a new solicitation for a new handgun, then called the XM-17 handgun trials. Now Beretta was not really invited to create an introductory or, or create a I should say a, uh, a, a firearm or a, a applicant for this trials, but they did decide to go ahead and revamp their existing pistol into the M9A3 and submit it into the modular handgun trials, the XM17 handgun trials. It was very quickly you know, eliminated from, from competition. The two main contenders in this competition would be Glock with the model 19X and SIG with the model now known as the M17, but was really a P320 that had been a, a sort of adapted and modified to hit into the requirements of the modular handgun trials. Now we all know that SIG did win this uh, competition and out of it came the SIG M17, which you can buy on the commercial market today, but that is what the military has now adopted and is moving into, or has moved into. Uh, but things like this did come out of the trials. There was also an offering from FN, 
uh, a couple other manufacturers as well. But you know, the the three most prominent uh, pistols that have come out of that trials that were developed for that were the SIG M17, the P320 M17, the M9A3 here, and the Glock 19X. So really, really cool sort of trifecta of firearms that came out of that solicitation. M9A3 is no exception. Now on the market, these are uh, going right now, uh, used for about what they would go for new, which is in about the thousand dollar ish plus or minus, depending on condition, what it comes with and all that. They do have a G model, which is a decocker only. A part of the somewhat modularity of the slide interchangeability with the different parts and changing your rear controls here uh, but otherwise it is a nice upgrade but still very much harkens back to the original concept of the 92 series developed all the way back in the 1970s just a really really cool firearm if you like the Beretta uh, M9 92 series 92FS 92S that sort of thing you're going to feel right at home but really brings the platform into the modern era so really really cool and happy to get that one in all right, up next is a really popular revolver from Ruger. This is the Ruger GP100. And this one actually comes to us from a viewer in Georgia. We actually got an opportunity to speak on the phone for a little while and it's a super nice guy. So uh, if you're watching, it was a pleasure talking with you and thank you so much for sending this one along. The Ruger GP100 would come about from Ruger in about 1985. It was really an evolutionary advancement going off of the Ruger security line that had been very popular throughout the 1970s. If we're looking at the GP100, it is really sort of a medium frame from their line of revolvers uh, up and a step from the SP101, which is really more their concealed carry variation in the full metal frame and a step down from things like the Black Hawk and the Red Hawk, which is really their big bore variety. Now these would be offered most commonly in the 357, but they could also be purchased in 10 millimeter, 327 Federal, uh, trying to think uh, 44 Special and uh, like this one, 822 Long Rifle, or really any 22 Rimfire uh, other than Magnum, but 22 Long Rifle particularly. Now these would be offered in two and a half, three, four, four point two, five, five and a half, and six inch barrel links in either a stainless steel or a blued finish. Now the 22 variation like this was only offered in a 5.5 inch barrel except for a thousand that were sold through Davidson's as a Davidson's exclusive in 2017 and this is one of those 1000 so actually a pretty rare and unique revolver uh being a 22 at the high vis fiber optic sight and a 4.2 inch barrel in its original box and all of that so that makes this actually a pretty unique revolver. Uh, if you look at the GP100 and uh, and really the full caliber variations, it competes very well to the 686 that you guys just saw. And typically those two sort of face off head to head in this category of revolver. Uh, the GP100 is known as being built like a tank, very heavy, robust firearm, especially something like this in a 22 would have very, very little recoil, uh, double single action with a transfer bar, really, really gentle shooting on the range and would likely make a really good revolver as being a target competition or something you can ease a new shooter into. Uh, having a 10 round capacity cylinder, again, I mean, with this weight, it's gonna feel like shooting a BB gun. So really, really cool firearms. Now. The GP100s uh, typically uh, new, you're gonna find them uh, in around the six to $700 mark. Prices are elevated, of course, everybody knows that. Now this being a little bit unique in the uh, you know Davidson's exclusive with the 4.2 inch barrel is gonna run you in about the 800 plus range depending on condition and what it comes with. I've seen them anywhere from, you know, typically 800-ish uh, upwards of just shy of a thousand, you know, respectively, depending on where you find it and what it comes with. But 800 is about right. But anyway, really, really cool revolver. Really happy to get this one in. And again, thank you to the gentleman in Georgia for sending this one along to us, GP100 and 22 long rifle. Okay, up next is a very interesting shotgun, which comes to us from a viewer in Illinois. This is a Utah's UTS 15 12 gauge pump action bullpup shotgun with a 15 round capacity. Now, by looking at this, you would think it looks a lot like a kel KSG, at least with the whole concept of having a dual magazine tube, and you would not be incorrect on that assumption. Uh, but they are really not related to one another. Now, the story with this would really begin back with Smith & Wesson in about 2005 when they would solicit Utah's Makine, or Makine, M-A-K-I-N-E, which is a Turkish company, to come up with the ultimate police and military 12 gauge shotgun. It had a list of specifications where the shotgun could not exceed a certain overall length. Can't remember what that was. Uh, it had to be at least 13 or more in capacity, which this is. Uh, had to uh, be under a certain weight. I think it was under eight pounds. Um, 
which this is. This is an injection uh, molded polymer, mostly polymer firearm. Uh, and it is in a bullpup configuration, which does load and eject here in the back. I'm sorry, it, it chambers and fires here in the back. Uh, it actually loads three series of loading ports up here on the top sort of centralized location on the firearm. Now while we're up here, this is a toggle switch to go between the two magazine tubes. So if you wanted to switch between lethal or non-lethal, black or slugs, you know, things like that, you could do that. Again, just like a KSG. And it is a pump shotgun with a pump release here. And there you go. Uh, very, very cool, very lightweight, and very handy shotgun. Now, these would go into development by Utah in Turkey in 2006. And by about 2012, it was ready for the U.S. commercial market and to be marketed in the United States to law enforcement. Now, there are two issues. Number one was with importation, and number two was with functionality. Let's talk about importation. So, in 1989, the ATF implemented a sporting clause for importation on firearms, where any firearms being imported into the United States had to serve a sporting function. Now, of course, this would be imported for Smith & Wesson and actually also Kemper for the U.S. domestic and law enforcement market. When it was looked at by the ATF, it was deemed very quickly that this can't possibly be a sporting shotgun. Definitely meant for tactical police or military application, therefore not allowed to come in. That would kind of kill it dead in the water in that regard. The other was with uh, early uh, testing, it had been viewed as not being a very reliable shotgun, especially for a pump action shotgun with issues with loading and extracting and ejecting uh, spent casings or shells. Uh, to get around the importation issue, Utah would actually create a local uh, uh, distribution, importation and distribution market. Sorry for all the digging, we're actually open right now. Uh, so they could bring in their own products and distribute them. So kind of changed the whole dynamic with Smith & Wesson and Kimber, so they would just distribute them themselves. And then they would come up with two new variations, a Gen 2 and a Gen 3, which would fix all the uh, issues with loading, extracting, firing, all that sort of stuff. So that had been pretty well worked out. Now, this would hit the market with a beginning MSRP of about $1,500, but on the used market today, you should find them around 1000 that's with elevated prices. So very interesting, unconventional, not all too commonly found. Very, very interesting bullpup, double magazine tube shotgun, Utah's UTS-15. Okay, up next I have a really cool pistol that comes to us from a viewer in Florida. So thank you so much for sending this one along to us. This is the STI International Staccato. This is a C model, single stack, nine millimeter pistol. Now this would be debuted by STI International in their 2011 series of handguns. Now the 2011 series is essentially a 1911 series that has been revamped into the modern age by doing things like having a heavy contour bull barrel, uh, adding a high-vis fiber optic sight, front side serrations, putting in a really, really nice match uh, grade trigger, really nice ergonomic and comfortable uh, grip panels. On the C model, you can stay in the single stack concealed carry variety if you like that traditional feel from a 1911. Going to the double stack, you're in the P series, really upping that capacity. So again, taking the real uh, benefits of the 1911 family and taking it from the older antiquated single stack 45 ACP, bringing it into the modern era with all full loaded features at a price point brand new at about the $2,000 mark. Um, this is really intended to be marketed to more elite law enforcement forces, uh, but of course could be used for the consumer uh, competition market for concealed carry and other things like that. And it does really shine very well in the market against other things in its class. So these are gaining a ton of momentum. Again, SCI International, which actually rebranded about in the past year to Staccato to go in line with their best-selling handgun line, the Staccato series of handguns. Uh, this is the duo version, which is a new, re uh, new-ish release with the optics plate. Of course, a lot of the uh, modern arms manufacturers are going in that direction as well. Um, not much else to say about it. Just really, really cool. There are a ton of videos of people using these in competition, doing quick fire drills and things like that. And this is, again, what this is intended to do. So meant to be very ergonomic, very reliable, very lightweight, easy to use, easy to maintain, uh, very quick target transitions. So just overall a seller firearm. So if you're thinking about getting into a more modernized premium 1911, this is something you should definitely look into the Staccato series from SCI International or Staccato Manufacturing. Uh, really, really cool firearm. Happy to get this in and thank you to our viewer again in Florida. 
All right, up next I have a very cool rifle and a classic. Uh, this one actually comes to us from a viewer in Michigan, so thank you for sending this one along to us. This is a Winchester model 1873. Specifically, this is a Uberti manufactured rifle, and I'll get a little bit into what that means here in a minute. Now, the story with the 1873 would actually begin back in 1860 with Benjamin Tyler Henry, who developed the first rifle of this type of concept, a lever action with the magazine tube underneath the barrel in 1860. Now, prior to that, there did exist things like the Spencer carbine, but it was a little bit different. It was more of a falling block action, ammunition loaded through the buttstock. You'd have to go to a half cock position between rounds, a little bit slower than the traditional repeating rifle, which you would load on Sunday and shoot all week long. Now the 1860 rifle was similar in form, but a little bit different in function. Again, like this, you had a magazine tube which went under the length of the barrel. There was no forward hand guard, hand grip, uh, and you opened up, toggled to the side, a uh, sort of an opening here in the front of the barrel in the magazine tube, which was actually machined as one solid piece. Drop your ammunition in through the front, close it, and then you would have a follower tab that would follow your rounds down as you would fire. In fact, as that tab would reach your hand, you would have to move your hand or else you would jam the rounds as you would be blocking the tab from advancing and feeding your ammunition. Now, Benjamin Tyler Henry would meet with Oliver Winchester. Now, Winchester at the time was a, a shirt designer and salesman, so not really involved in the firearms manufacturing or retail side of the business, but he did know how to operate and grow businesses, which is really what his uh, interests were. Uh, Benjamin Tyler Henry really knew the gunsmithing and gun manufacturing side of things, so together they would form the New Haven, Connecticut Manufacturing, uh, and then they would begin production on the 1860. Now, they would have a falling out, and uh, Benjamin Tyler Henry would leave not really sure if that was under his own choosing, but he would leave the business. And then Winchester would come up with the design of the 1866. Very similar again to the 1860 and would sort of bridge the gap here. But again, now you have the handguard and the biggest innovation difference is you have the implementation of the King's Patent loading gate. So instead of loading from the front, you're loading from the back. We now have a handguard. Um, really cool innovative de design, but still chambered in the 44 rimmed. Now, at the time, we had this brass alloy frame, same with the Model 1860. Winchester wanted to come out with something that was more affordable, more economical, uh, something that really everybody could afford, purchase, rugged, easily to use, and would really become the frontier rifle. So would come along the 1873. Uh, you would get away from the brass. You would have a multitude of different chamberings, initially the 4440, the 3220, uh, 3850, if I'm not... Uh, misidentifying that, um, or the 44 WCF, 4440 is really the same thing. WCF stands for Winchester Center Fire, and this is the first center fire rifle in the lever action lineup from Winchester. Still using the toggle link system that was developed for the 1860 and the 1866. Uh, but this would really become the most popular and well uh, known and most purchased lever gun in that era, even more so than things that would come after it with you know bringing on John Br uh, Browning with the 1886 and things of that nature. So really, really cool rifles. They did manufacture, manufacture these from 1873 up to about the early 1920s, uh, having three distinct production runs or series of the rifle. So really, really cool. Now the story on this one, a company named Uberti based out of Italy would be founded in 1959 and they would specialize in coming up with uh, reproduction, cowboy action, Western firearms. They have a, a whole lineup. They still exist today of lever action firearms like this. They make all the popular models. They have, you know, the Sharps rifles. They have the single action armies, the Schofields and things like that. There are two main importers of those firearms into the United States today. That's Cimarron and Taylor. There are a couple others um, that come in, you know, through Italy, like Petersoli, Chiapa, things of that nature. But Uberti is probably the most popularly and well-known. Um, also, Winchester, the, the Winchester brand does manufacture a line of these today as well. Those are actually manufactured by Moroku in Japan. Now, the retail value on either the Uberti or the Moroku guns new on the 1873, and this is the short rifle configuration. I'll explain the difference here in a minute. They're going to run around the $1,300 mark, used maybe around 1000 in good condition. So this is a fantastic condition. This is in 45 Colt, popular caliber. Um, although, you know, the 4440 is probably the most popular chambering for something like this. But still very popular. There's a lot of cowboy action shooters that chamber their, uh, their 1873s in 45 Colt. So good to have the same caliber to move over between your pistol and your rifle. Such was the mentality uh, on the frontier <laughs> back in those days anyway. Anyway, really, really cool. Now, the short rifle configuration. 
There's two distinctive features of a rifle in the Winchester lineup. You have the crescent butt plate and you have a cap here at the end of your handguard. Those are rifle features. However, original barrel length would have been about 24 inches. This is down to 20, making it the short rifle. Now the carbines were about 20 inches, but you would have a barrel band here and a shotgun style flat butt plate in the back if it's going to be something like a saddle ring carbine. So you have the carbine, the rifle, and the short rifle. They made other variations as well back. In those days, you could special order, you know, however really you wanted to, uh, different configurations. So really, really cool rifle. Really happy to get that in. A Uberti slash Winchester 1873. Okay, last but not least is a really cool rifle which comes to us from a viewer in Alabama. So thank you so much for sending this one along to us. This is a Ruger SR762, which came onto the scene from Ruger in about 2009. Uh, this was Ruger's AR-10 variant. It did use a gas piston, a two-stage gas piston system, which gives a little bit of weight here up at the front end. Also keeping it really reliable and clean inside the receiver. Everybody knows the, the idea of a gas piston system. Uh, chamber for 762 NATO or 308. Now, the rifle did uh, have a lot of success upon initial launch in terms of uh, testing with reliability, function, recoil, and things of that nature against other things like it in the market at that time. Now, back in 2009, the landscape of this type of equipment was not uh, hugely saturated as it is today. However, as time would go on, it would start to gain criticism for its price point. Okay, Ruger was always known for having Entry level to, I want to say, mid-tier firearms, their pricing has never been known, or Ruger has never been known as a premium manufacturer of high-end things. Now, they did have a 5.56 variant called the SR-5.56, which came out at about the same time. That was also met with similar criticism. The MSRP on these things exceeded $2,000 which again, if we look in today's uh, sort of uh, uh, lineup of uh, products from Ruger against things like the Mini 14 or the AR556, which tend to retail sub thousand dollars, this was a pretty much of a sticker shock to people who were uh, interested in Ruger products. Also, they didn't really have the mystique as being a military arms manufacturer like Colt or FN, uh, so they didn't really have that much appeal either. Now, in 2014, Ruger would come out, come out with the AR556 uh, line that we all really enjoy today. And again, typically you find those in about the six to $800 price point, depending on the variation you're getting. And that's a standard direct impingement system. Now with the massive popularity of the AR556 series and other things coming online from other manufacturers and the AR10, especially the gas piston uh, uh, type of platform, these would very, very quickly suffer in sales and would be dis discontinued in 2018. So only manufactured for about nine years and they are pretty uncommon to find on the retail market. Uh, if you're looking news, I think I've maybe had two of these since I opened, so you don't find them too too often. Now, price point aside, these actually are really, really, really nice rifles. They are known for being very reliable, very rugged, and having really good recoil control. Uh, but again, for the time, I mean, this is 2009 technology for the AR-10 platform. It's getting a little antiquated against other things that are coming out at a similar price point. So. Again, I understand uh, Ruger's reasons for wanting to discontinue the line. Now, if you're looking on the used market, they do hover anywhere between about 1500 and about 1800 plus ish uh, used, depending on what they come with. You know, this has its original carry case and all that sort of stuff in excellent condition. So this might go 16 to 18, somewhere in there. Uh, but anyway, a really, really cool rifle. Really happy to get this one in. And that is a Ruger SR762. Well, that is all the time I have for you today on these. Thank you so much for stopping by and checking out this video. If you enjoyed, please let me know by hitting that like button. And please also consider subscribing to my channel and hitting that bell notification button so you are aware when we are posting these videos. Anyway, guys, I'm going to leave you off there. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports and WeBuyGuns.com in Westfield, Indiana. You are watching Marksman TV, and I will see you next time.